Your Life in Sex Island, Chapter 6, The Life in Sex Island, page 194. Things, that is the economy, went to hell on our peaceful little island. Yes, Trader Mac took control of the free spring water, and selling that free water, he was able to take all of the wealth on our little island. The remainder of the islanders had virtually nothing because they had to pay so much for the free spring water, a very large inequality developed on our peaceful island. I am against the vast wealth differential that developed on our little life and sex island for five reasons. One, I am not one of the lucky rich and therefore I am envious and wish to fix the problem. Two, some of us are in desperation mode because of the systematic, vast, unrelenting, terrible lies that were told for the last 60 years. And these lies and liars ought not to be rewarded. Three, while I would agree that the harder you work, the luckier you get, I would also say that the fact that only a tiny, tiny percent get lucky enough to be among the super rich, while at least 2% by definition of the remainder of us are geniuses and a much higher percent work very hard and very smart. And in fact, the super rich are not usually smart, dedicated, or hardworking, that it is a matter of a lucky break that a few, by luck, become super rich and it is, therefore, unfair. Four, because the rich can and do by the lawmakers and the newsmakers, the system is biased in favor of the rich and is therefore unfair. Five, the vast wealth differential doesn't work. As on the life and sex island, the economy collapses because the vast poor don't have enough wealth to provide the necessities of life. The super rich are desperate to earn more money on their wealth and cannot stand to see any of their wealth sitting idle and they begin to chase one or another scheme to increase their return and the system spirals up and collapses because there is no base. Thus the vast wealth differential doesn't work. I hope that at some time in your life you will or were a serious poker player. I have been in poker games where the host dragged the pot. That is, the host took a fixed amount of money out of every pot to pay for the beer or some such thing. It is amazing how much more difficult it is to go home a winner when someone is dragging the pot than when there is no one dragging the pot. In today's economy, folks, the rich and the super rich are dragging two-thirds of every pot. That's 10% of us are taking two-thirds of the money. It's hard to win, folks. The game becomes pretty senseless and nigh impossible. It simply doesn't work. Lots of people simply give up. No question that the rich are monsters and murderers. They can be as charitable and philanthropic and found as many foundations as they wish. It changes nothing. They are monsters and murderers. But remember, you and I would be there if we could. I say it, the system of vast wealth differential doesn't work. But that is from an engineering system standpoint. Obviously, the super rich prefer the present system, which collapses into slowdown, crises, panics, recessions, and depressions periodically, and demands that most of the people become servile and forces them into thraldom to the super rich. But from an engineering standpoint, a ship that is slow, impossible to steer, leaks water so bad that half the crew spends their time bailing, and despite valiant efforts on the part of the crew, the ship sinks or partially sinks 10 to 25 percent of the time is not a successful or properly functioning ship. From an engineering standpoint, it is time to trade ships or put this one in dry dock 
for major repairs. The super rich will pull out all stops, including sinking the ship, to prevent any repairs. All of Trader Mac's tooth fountain poets will begin a cacophony of objections. A few years ago, maybe as much as 20, there was a documentary on TV that followed four fantastically successful entrepreneurs while they were starting a new second business. I only remember who two of the examples were. One was Steve Jobs, the co-founder of Apple Computer, after he had been fired by the guy from Pepsi who he had hired. He, Steve Jobs, was starting a new company that he called Next. Steve Jobs later went back to Apple. I'm pretty sure the second example was Frederick Wallace Smith, the founder of Federal Express. I don't remember what second business he was starting. There was also the other two founders of extremely successful companies who were each founding a new second company. The point of the documentary was to show us Tyro wannabes how simple it was in the hands of pros. Well, it didn't work out that way. All four new businesses failed. Despite an infinite amount of money poured into them and experts crawling all over them, all four new businesses failed. The lesson that I learned was that you can be very smart and very rich and still fail in a new venture because you are missing one key ingredient, luck. Without Lady Luck holding your balls, you will fail. On with the story of American economics. I'm not going to give you digest biographies. There are many books about America's robber barons, or if you prefer, America's industrial giants who founded America's super successful free enterprise system and benefited the rest of us. I'll try not to take sides. Had I been born in their shoes, with their luck, I would be or would have been one of them and not be apologetic. So would you. Don't lie about it. But I want to show you how we got into the pickle that we are in. I will scan about a hundred years from about 1908 to 2008. I have to set it up with J.D. Rockefeller, who really belongs to an earlier period and is one of the prototypes for the new Nibs Super Rich and Trader Mac. I promised no digest biographies. Nevertheless, I have to mention John D. Rockefeller, the much maligned, the master. At his peak in about 1908, he was worth about a billion dollars. Today that might be 25 or 250 billion, but you probably won't find the Rockefeller name on any list of the rich. In 1895, he paid taxes of a little less than $15,000 on an income of about one and a quarter million, taxed at 2%. He had some deductions, expenses, etc. A coal miner then earned about $300 a year. He was pretty clumsy then yet. He got better, and it was our own fault. Judge Landis ordered Standard Oil broken up in 1911. That may be what started JDR on the road to even greater success. He, John D. Rockefeller, did not want Standard Oil broken up any more than you or I would want our kid cut in two. You or I might ask a lawyer, oh, what can I do? The rich don't think that way. They say, make what I am doing legal. JDR started a bunch of trusts. He oiled a little here, and he oiled a little there. Pretty soon, Standard Oil was all broken up, and all, or most, of the pieces were still in JDR's hands. Today, there are so many Rockefeller Trusts and other paper entities that no government has any idea how much the Rockefellers are worth or how much they own. The people on the rich list are the new kids on the block who haven't learned anything yet. We will have to run along now. I still have a few more things to say about the Rockefellers, mostly complimentary. And we will revisit our friends on the Life and Sex Island. I'll be back. Purchase the book now by clicking the link 
in the description below.